348, My Savior's Love. We'll sing the first and the last. Good to be reminded of the Savior's love for you today. Man, we need that love, don't we? Hey, Aaron. Amen. Man, it's good to see you this morning. Aaron, uh, Aaron uh, has had a lot going on and hadn't been able to be with us in a long time. And uh, I know he's happy to be back with us. And man, good to see you today, Aaron. Wow. Well, we got half the country celebrating and half the country depressed. Are you that surprised? You know, it kind of goes along with 2020, right? But you know, um, I'm reminded that uh, no matter who's in the White House, God's still on the throne, isn't he? He is still on the throne. And, and as Christians, we're still called to be the church. And uh, as we've been talking about, uh, we need to engage our culture. We need to engage the politics. We need to do all of that as a church with the gospel and that is true, we do, regardless of who's in the White House. And guess what? As Christians, um, we're called to pray for our president, whether we agree with their policies or not. And we're called to uh, love our country and support our country and pray and be the church that God calls us to be and not be hypocrites when it comes to things and things not working out the way we might want it to work out. So, uh, so let's continue uh, to be the church and let's be reminded Let's be reminded what Jeremiah said. You know, God's people had a lot of folks that ruled over them that they didn't agree with and wasn't godly at times. But yet the prophets and many of the godly people continued uh, to pursue God through the midst of it all, trusting that God had a plan. And this is what Jeremiah said. And this, this uh, speaks to my heart a lot today. For I know the plans I have for you. That's great, isn't it? God still has plans for us. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you as my people, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's God's plan for the church. He has a hope. He has a future to prosper us, right, as his people. But look at what it says. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. Man, my brother Tim, me and him have been talking. He texts me, uh, he texts me a, a statement of faith uh, by Dr. Adrian Rogers. And, uh, and it kind of stuck with me. I can't remember the exact word. So I'm going to ask him to share that with us this morning. Because I know, I, know I know he never forgets. So he, he knows. Isn't that good? Faith is not as much about getting what you want as it is about being all right with what God gives. Right? And our faith is in God's word. And our faith is that he's still on the throne. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much that we could come here today, gather as a church, Lord, 
and look to you as our hope and as our future. Lord, I pray that in the midst of all of this chaos and craziness, in the midst of division within our country, Lord, that our church and churches all across our country, Lord, would be revived and would rise up and be that unifying force and that voice, Lord, of truth and that example, Lord, of righteousness and love, Lord, and unity within our country. Lord, I pray, I pray, God, that the church would be, Lord, that key piece of bringing our country back together through the power of the gospel. Lord, help us to do that, Lord, in our own community and communities all over uh, our great land. And Lord, we do pray. We do pray, Lord, for our president, for all of our leadership. God, we, we pray, God, for righteousness and for justice and for truth. And we pray, God, for you to change hearts at every level of leadership throughout our country, God. And I pray, Lord, that, um, that you, Lord, would see fit, God, to be gracious to us, to fill us with your spirit, and to help us realize, first and foremost, we're citizens of the kingdom of God, and that we are to focus, Lord, on living for Christ and being who Christ calls us to be every single day, Lord, because ultimately, our hope doesn't rest, Lord, in our political system. It rests in, in you as our living Lord and Savior. Ultimately, Lord, our hope doesn't rest in who's in the White House, but, Lord, who's on the throne of heaven. And, Lord, we praise you, Lord, that you are on the throne, that you are laying out your plan and your purpose, Lord, for this world. You are bringing this world to an end according, Lord, uh, to your will and purpose. Help us, God, to be focused on that as a church and living for Jesus every single day, doing what you call us to do so that the light of Christ can shine through our lives Lord, and make a difference, Lord, around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you'll join me in singing 605, Living for Jesus. We'll sing the first and last.
And now if you'll turn with me as we sing our offertory hymn. And then after our offering, if Justin and Will come and lead us worship music. Um, and we can face anything because of because he lives, right? 358, let's sing the first and third. Let us pray. Our Father, God, has come to you this morning, God. I'm, Lord, I'm so thankful, God, for the truth that's in that song, Lord, that you live. Father, I thank you, God, that through your resurrection, God, you give us the power, God, to endure anything. Lord, that even in, when the times may seem uncertain, God, we know that uh, nothing has taken you by surprise, Lord, that you're in control. And Father, this morning, I pray, God, if there be one in our midst, God, that's never realized, God, the, the power of the resurrection, Lord, that can bring them salvation. God, I pray, God, the Holy Spirit might convict, Lord, and God, that they might experience that miracle this morning. Lord, I thank you for all the good things, God, you give us. Lord, uh, as we live in this time of uncertainty, God, we know that you are certain. Lord, I pray that we may not be anxious, God, but Lord, that we may place our trust, Lord, in you, God, and that we may let your light shine through us, Father, that we may be a, a beacon, God, into this uh, sinful world, Lord. Help us, God, to as Chad said, Lord, to uplift the president-elect in our prayers, God. Help us, Lord, to live lives, God, is pleasing to thee. Lord, I pray for this part of the service, God, that you may bless the gift and the giver. Thank you for all you do for us. Most of all, Lord, for saving us. In Jesus' name.
I like that one. It is well with my soul. Give her a hand. You know, like we've been talking with, uh, with all the uncertainty, everything, but that song is just, if it's well with your soul, that's all that really matters. So you can take that to heart. All right, let's sing this morning. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh it may fail There's an anchor for my soul You know I can say And I can say It is well Jesus has over And the grave is overwhelmed. The victory, it is won. And he has risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will. On eagle's wings before my God Fall on my knees and rise I will rise There's a day that's drawing near When this darkness turns the light and the shadows disappear and my faith will be my eyes Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed victory it is one, yeah, and he has risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God.
Amen. Man, that's good. Wow. Doesn't coming to church make you feel better? Amen. It does. It picks your, picks your spirits up. It gives you peace in your heart. It reminds you uh, who's in control. And man, it's good to be here. It is good to be here. But you know, coming to church isn't about really making us feel good, right? I mean, that's not God's priority. Coming to church is about getting our hearts right with God so that we can live by His truth and we can receive God's blessings in our lives as a result of living according to His will and according to His truth, right? Great to, uh, to be in church today. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity we have to worship you today. And Lord, as, as we come to your word and as we look at uh, the, the last message about tearing down strongholds and, and sparking revival, Lord, as we talk about the church today, I pray, God, that you would anoint your word. I pray that we would have a great desire, Lord, to see our church healthy and, and prosper, Lord, and, and living in a way, Lord, that makes a difference for Christ and, and, and truly presents Christ in our community. God, God, I pray that you would just bless us with your spirit today and that you would speak to each of our hearts about our relationship with the church and our relationships together, which make up the church, and Lord, how we live out our lives and be the church where you call us to be and how you call us to be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, our last message today on tearing down strongholds and sparking revival. We've talked about tearing down those strongholds in your personal life, your family life, in the community. And today we're going to talk about the church. Tearing down strongholds within the church. What in the world am I talking about, right? So when you look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and Paul talks about this spiritual warfare that we're in, he says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world wages. The church fights differently in this culture and in this world. He said, for the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish or tear down strongholds in your personal life, in your family life, within the, within the church, and within the community. So here we go. So we demolish every argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's how strongholds are torn down, is when thoughts and arguments and things that are against the knowledge of God come unto obedience of Christ by the truth of Christ. So let's talk about the church today, and strongholds that can be set up in our church by Satan. There was a young couple that it had a serious car wreck. This was many, many years ago. They managed to get out of the car. And the young lady, was she was severely hurt, bleeding profusely. The young man, he was banged up a little bit, but, but he was okay. As they get out of the car as, and, look, and look around, there on the hill, they see a house. And out beside that house is the sign, Dr. Rufus Jones, Internal Medicine. Well, this young man, he, he struggles to get the young lady out of the car, and he picks her up. And with all that he has, he carries her up the hill to the house, begins knocking on the door, and the old gentleman answers the door. The young man says, are, are you Dr. Jones? Yes, I am. He said, my, my wife is, is, is dying. She's bleeding. We've had this wreck, and, and we need your help. I need you to save her life. And he replied, I'm sorry, son. I can't help you. I don't practice medicine anymore. I don't have any, any equipment. I don't have any medical supplies. And then he says, the young man says, well, the sign, the sign out in front of your house, it says that you're a doctor. He says, I know, son, but I don't practice medicine anymore. 
I just haven't taken down the signs. Now I want you to think about that in relationship to the church. As the church, we have a world that's bleeding and dying. And we say, come to church. Get involved in church. In church, you'll find the healing that you need. But yet, there are many churches that have the sign out front, but they no longer practice the gospel. They no longer practice the gospel. If we're going to have the sign, Friendship Baptist Church, Shouldn't we be the church? Or should we just take the name out? Take the sign down? There's plenty of uh, clubs you can be a member of. There's plenty of social gatherings. There's plenty of sports teams that you can be a part of. There's plenty of other activities in this world that we can be a part of. Do we need to take the name church out? And just be a club here at Friendship? A group of folks who have our activities and the things that we like to do? We're going to have the sign up. We're going to be Friendship Baptist Church. Don't you think we need to be the church? Man. You know, Jesus called us to be the body of Christ in our community. That means that we are responsible for preserving the gospel. We're responsible for preaching the gospel. We're responsible for practicing the gospel in such a way in our community that we present Christ to our community. We're responsible for that. Friendship Baptist Church is responsible and accountable to God for the gospel. You know, isn't it something, and you might have had this experience in your life as well, to drive through a a, a part of a city or a community, and and you can tell that that city is, is, uh, community is run down. You can tell that they're struggling, whether it's with drugs in the community or whatever that it might be. It's a struggling community, and yet you see a church on the corner here, a church on the corner there. They're old, they're fading, and you think, Wow, that church is sitting, and those churches are sitting right in the middle of this community that is gripped by all of these struggles and all of these problems. Why isn't the church transforming the community instead of the church dying with the community? Why is that? It's because of the strongholds that Satan has erected within the churches today. He targets churches spiritually, emotionally, and relationally. He sets up his strongholds within the lives of God's people he pre- and prevents the church from being the church. And in many cases, in many cases, we, friendship, we fail to recognize and respond to the spiritual battles we face. The church is losing ground to Satan. Allowing Satan to build his strongholds. And from these strongholds, he divides God's people, damages our witness as a church, ruins our reputation in the community, and destroys the work of the church, diminishing God's glory that we are supposed to be shining. So what are these strongholds? Because, you see, I I don't want to take down our sign. I want to tear down the stronghold. How about you? How about you? So what are some of these strongholds? I'm going to give you five strongholds, and then I'm going to give you five ways that we tear down the strongholds. Okay? I'm not going to go into a great number of details because it's a lot of points, but I want to point them out to you. I want you to see them. Take a hold of them. Understand what God's Word is telling us. The first stronghold that is developed within the church that Satan uses is the immaturity of believers. Immaturity of believers. 
when you are saved, when you walk through those waters of baptism, God's purpose in your life was to grow you from a babe in Christ to be mature in Christ, to have the attitude and the actions and the character of Christ, to think like Christ in your life, to be mature. And Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, he says, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, of the world, as babies in Christ. Man, there, there's a, a lot of folks sitting in church that they don't get it when the preacher preaches because they're babies in Christ. They're not growing in their faith. And Paul said what was causing conflict in the church at Corinth, they were envious of each other, they were jealous of each other, they had strife, they had division, they were nitpicking, they were fighting among one another. Some of them said, well, we follow Apollos, and some said, well, we follow Peter, and some said, we follow Paul. And Paul said, you're immature in your thinking and in your relationship with the Lord because you're following personalities and you're following your preferences. You're not following the person of Christ. They were self-centered instead of Christ-centered. And that's what's wrong with our churches today. We are immature members thinking that the church is about us. And too often... The church house operates like a daycare rather than the body of Christ. Whining and complaining and fussing and fighting because people are getting their way. Immaturity in the believers is a stronghold in the church. I want to tell you, friendship, each one of you sitting on the pew today, you have a responsibility to grow up in Christ through the Word of God and through your prayer life. Second thing is this, not only immaturity within the believers, but immorality in the life of believers. Sin in the church is keeping the church from being the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul, Paul moves from addressing immaturity in the lives of the believers to immorality, and he says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. The kind of sexual immorality that's not even tolerated among the Gentiles or the unbelievers. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul says, you as the church are just turning a blind eye to it. You're not confronting it. You're not going to him and talking to him about it. You're not demanding that he repent and quit this sinful lifestyle. You are just allowing it to happen. And he goes on to say, don't you know that a little bit of yeast is going to affect the whole batch of dough? And I can tell you from experience, from my own, own failures and mistakes in, in ministry in relation to the church, when you overlook and tolerate things, it affects the whole church. It affects everybody. And it ruins the reputation of the church. And as believers, we got to uphold truth and righteousness and refuse to compromise. Jesus talked about sin in Matthew chapter 18, and he said sin is so serious that if you cause a little one to stumble, meaning those within the church and congregations of believers, if you are the source of that, Man, it's better for you to have a milestone, millstone hung around your neck and you to be cast into sea because you are destroying people's faith and lives when you let immorality exist. He said it's so serious that if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Deal with it. He goes on to say, if you got a brother that sins within the church, go to him, talk to him. If you don't listen, take two or three witnesses with you. Talk to them. If you don't listen to them, bring it to the church or the larger group to try to address it, but deal with it. When did we stop dealing with immorality in the church? Now, used to, you get kicked out of friendship if you caught dancing. 
or if you'd call it chewing tobacco or something of that nature, right? And I'm not harping on that. I'm focusing on a bigger issue. As pastor and as a church, we need to understand that those are strongholds. And we need to be praying about how to deal with those strongholds. Third thing is this. Not only immorality and immaturity in the life of believers, but false doctrine, false teaching within the church. Now the church centers on the gospel and it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. But they are cinch pins, they are key pieces of the gospel that you can't remove. One is the person of Christ. He's fully God, he's fully man. And false teaching centers around the person of Christ. You deny his divinity or you deny his humanity and you're teaching falsely. Also, the work of the cross. It is very clear that the gospel says it is only through the cross that man's sins are forgiven and he's reconciled to God. You remove the work of the cross and it's false teaching. The power of the resurrection the empty tomb, God, uh, Jesus' physical resurrection. It is a central piece of the gospel. You deny the resurrection, you deny the saving power of the gospel. Salvation. The Bible says salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The person of Christ, the work of the cross, and the power of the resurrection. If you put works into salvation, you are teaching falsely. If you say anybody has to be saved by doing A, B, C, plus believe, you are teaching falsely. Paul spoke specifically to this. In Acts chapter 20, he told Timothy, who was the pastor of the church at Ephesus, he said, men will rise up from among your own number. They will distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Man, we need to be paying attention to false teaching. It is addressed all through the New Testament. Galatians, Paul addressed the fact that people were saying you need to convert to Judaism and be circumcised before you can be saved. And Paul said that's a lie. It's false teaching. In Colossians, it, the heresy centered around the person of Christ and he said, no, Christ is the image of the invisible God. 1 Thessalonians, it centered around the second coming of Christ. And people said the rapture had already happened, the second coming had already happened. And Paul said, no, that's false teaching. So you see this all through. We have to pay attention because strongholds are built up in the church all across this country through false teaching, twisting and distorting the word of God. But here's number four. You got immaturity of believers. Satan builds strongholds because people are immature. You've got immorality because in the pews of the church, there are people who are living like the devil. And Satan builds his stronghold. Number three, false teaching. Whether from the pulpit or held by the leadership of the church or in the Sunday school classes. Strongholds. Number four, and here is very important. It is the unforgiving hearts of God's people. Some of the major strongholds and some of the main issues that hold revival back from within the church is the unforgiving hearts that are sitting in the pews. Satan develops strongholds around people's bitterness, around their resentment, what they don't like about other people within the church, what somebody has said to them that has offended them, what somebody has done to, quote, offend them. You've heard the statement, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven, right? Some people like to use that flippantly, but it's true. Forgiving is the key, and the parable of the unforgiving servant is so important. Matthew chapter 18. It's in that same chapter where Jesus is talking about sin. Where he's talking about church discipline and reconciliation. And Peter comes up and he asks, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times seven? Or seven times, he said. Now what Peter said, uh, the rabbis taught in that day that you were to forgive a person three times if they offended you. Three times. That's what they taught. That was your limit. After the third time, you didn't have to forgive them anymore. That's a pretty human thing, right? So Peter knows Jesus, so he doubles it and adds one. Seven times, Lord. 
Jesus says, no, 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 you're not getting it. Seventy times seven. Forgiveness is not just a choice, an act you make. Forgiveness is an attitude that you have toward your brother and sister in Christ. He goes on to tell the story of the unforgiven servant. You remember that story? The servant who couldn't pay his debt to the master and the debt forget in the in the master forgave his whole debt, and then he turns around to a fellow servant who owed him just a fraction of what he had owed the master, and he demanded to be paid, and he had his fellow servant thrown into prison until he would pay back his debt. And then when the other servants heard this, they went to the master. It infuriated the master, and he had this unforgiving servant thrown into prison, and he said, you're not getting out until you pay your debt off. The important part of that parable is this. The man couldn't pay the debt off. He was never getting out of prison. The only way out was forgiveness. The only way out of many of your prisons and many of the strongholds within the church is the act of forgiveness. And Jesus says something stunning in that parable. Jesus said, you see this unforgiving servant that refused to forgive his fellow servant? He said, God will treat you the same way if you fail to forgive your brother and your sister from the heart. You're going to be locked up in bitterness and resentment and the strongholds of Satan will be bound in the church through unforgiving hearts of God's people. Let me ask you this. Who do you need to forgive in friendship? Who, who do you need to forgive? That person that comes up when you're having those conversations in the church and, and you run them down, well, they do this and then you yeah, do this at the church. Well, I can't believe the way so-and-so. They want to control everything and they want to do this and they want to do that. That person that you run down within the church, that's the person you need to be forgiven. And if you're not, Satan's developing a stronghold in our church and holding our church back. Unforgiving hearts. Satan stronghold. Don't be a stronghold for Satan at Friendship Baptist Church. Forgive who you need to forgive. Unfaithful lives. So there you have it. Immorality, in the life, immaturity in the life of believers. Immorality in the life of believers. False teaching within the church. Unforgiving hearts in the lives of the people and unfaithful lives among the members. Strongholds. Unfaithful lives among the members. In Hebrews chapter 25, it says that we are not to neglect to gather together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do you hear what God's Word says? Do not neglect assembling yourself together. Don't do it, the Bible says. Be committed to the church. Now, isn't it interesting that, that we got this big debate going on about our fine young people down here and all of our children? about school, right? Now, what, what, what came out through all of this COVID stuff? Children need what kind of learning? In-person learning. They need to be in school, right? They need to be around their peers. Virtual learning doesn't cut it, right? Isn't that right? Amen, teachers? Amen, Aaron, you're with us. And then our parents were like, amen, in-person. In person, right? Here's the danger of where we are as a church today. Everybody is wanting to pick everything they get up on social media here and there. You cannot substitute. If science tells us that in-person learning is the most valuable thing for our kids... It goes for the church as well. That's what the Bible's talking about. Don't neglect assembling yourselves together. There's a no substitute 
for coming together as God's people in person, if possible. There's no substitute. There's no substitute for that Sunday school class praying together. There's no substitute for those deacons praying together and coming together, studying God's Word together. There's no substitute for that. However, the unfaithfulness in the lives of Christians is a stronghold and it's making the church ineffective in the community. A lack of commitment is the major stronghold in our churches today. People are committed to do what's important to them. You're going to go to work because that's how you pay your bills, right? And a lot of us are, drag ourselves to work half dead because we got to work. We got to pay the bills, Right? We will wear ourselves out from one ball game to another ball game, no matter how bad COVID is. We're going to show up and play games, ain't we? We're going to do it. Because it's important. School, hobbies, all of these things we are committed to. As a church, if we're to be loving Christ and reaching people, that requires our commitment. And I just want to be honest with you. Man, back in October, I was so discouraged because nobody was showing up on Sunday night for our revival services to pray for our nation, to listen to, to important issues, to listen to testimonies about what God is, is doing. Some nights we had about 10 people here, maybe. And a lot of them were, thank y'all for coming, by the way. The young folks showed up and led the way. They represented, in their number, more than anybody else within the church. I thought, well, maybe the parking lot's full on Sunday night. Maybe people just a little leery coming into the church. And, well, you know, one or two cars out there. We're still struggling with, with Sunday school and all those issues because folks are just complacent. I think a lot of people through all this COVID has learned, <laughs> I don't really need the church. Aaron said, amen. I got my phone, I can do this, I can do that, I got... And I think folks have just settled and said, you know, I really don't need to go to church. COVID has taught me that I don't need church. And I want to tell you, that's a lie. And uncommitment in the life of Christians is a stronghold in the church. And it is going to make our church ineffective in our community. So let's close with this. How about we through the next half of the message next Sunday. You be okay with that? Or you want to give me to 12? We'll close the first half of this message here. We'll pick up the next, next Sunday on the five things that we need to do to tear down these strongholds. But I want you to think about it in these terms. Do you ever remember... I remember as a kid, I remember as a kid, you know, the lights would go out, the clocks would go off, and you would be trying to set your clock. And how are you going to have the right time? Well, back in the day when I was a kid, I remember you could call the bank. 
Anybody remember doing that? You call the bank to get the official time. You don't know nothing about that today, do you? That was back with, uh, they had those party lines, you know, when you talk to somebody and somebody else start talking that you didn't know, you, t- you know, and everybody else can hear your conversations and all that fun stuff. Boy, y'all missed out on some good stuff back in those days, I'm telling you. But you'd pick up and you'd call. Nowadays, how many of you, when, when time changed here a little while back, like, was that last Sunday? Well, it feels like forever ago, don't it? You know, I never even looked at it because it rolled over on my phone automatically. Two o'clock, rolled up, rolled back, right? The way it's supposed to because my phone is connected to the source, whatever that it is, that has the right time, right? Because of that connection, it's automatically set. Now listen to me as we close this up. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, it says that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, He is the firstborn among the dead, that He might come to have, listen to this, first place in everything, Colossians 1.18. In other words, Christ is the one that you are to be setting your life by. You are to be setting yourself straight, knowing how to live, knowing what to do according to Christ who is the head of the church. Every one of us should be setting our life according to Christ. And if the strongholds in Friendship Baptist Church through immaturity, immorality, false teaching, through unforgiving hearts and unfaithful lives, if those strongholds are going to come down, the people in the pew are going to have to set their hearts right with the Lord. That's what revival is all about. That's what revival is all about. When we set our hearts right with the Lord, we can engage the strongholds and the strongholds will come down and we will be the church. We won't just have a sign up. We'll be the church. People will come to our church and meet Christ and experience freedom and healing and the love of the gospel because we're being the church. That's what I desire. That's what I pray for. That's what I So what needs to be set right in in your life so that you will be committed to the strongholds falling, whatever they may be in our church, and we can be the church that God calls us to be? You know, in Revelations, there was a church. We'll talk more about this church next Sunday. It's a church called Laodicea. It was a group of wealthy Christians in a wealthy city. They were so wealthy (laughs) that they were comfortable, they were complacent. But the problem was they didn't have a fellowship with the Lord. They were too focused on their own prosperity. They were too focused on their own pleasure that they were missing out on the presence and the power of God in their lives and within the church. We'll talk more about it next week. But you know what the Lord told them? He said, I stand at the door and knock. He said, you've shut me out. Your pursuit for prosperity, your pursuit for pleasure, and you're going through the motions of religion, you have shut me out. You are spiritually bankrupt. He said, I stand at the door and knock. And if you will open that door, I will come in and I'll fellowship with you. I will renew my relationship with you, bring my presence and my power back into your life in ways it really matters. So the Lord's knocking on the door of your heart today. Opening that door is the key to tearing down strongholds in our church. It is the key. But it starts with you and I being convicted by the Lord and actually caring about our church. Yeah, you know, I'm afraid we've got to a point where very few people actually care about the church actually care about it. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad we have a church down there. I, I like going sometimes. But I think very few people actually care about what happens at the church. And that's a shame. I stand at the door and knock, Jesus said. 
wouldn't it be great if y'all opened the door? If y'all opened it, and y'all opened it, and y'all opened it, and I opened it. And he came in, and his presence and his power made such a difference in our life that our church was revived, and it just began to blossom and take off and make a difference, a powerful difference in our community. Lord, thank you for your love for us and all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, and Lord, that and we would strive, Lord, to know you and love you and live for you every day the way you call us to. Lord, forgive us as Christians, Lord, for just not wanting to grow up. Lord, forgive us, Lord, for things that in our lives that, that, are, that are ungodly and that you're calling us to remove, Lord. I pray, God, that we would that we would confess our sins to you and repent, Lord, and allow you to just change our hearts and fill our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, uh, that you would help us, Lord, from our Sunday school classes to the pulpit, Lord, to teach the truth of the gospel relentlessly and without compromise. Lord, I pray, God, that, that we, Lord, would overcome any unforgiving hearts, Lord, within, within our church, Lord, that people would, would forgive each other, reach out to each other, love each other, so that Satan can't use that, Lord, to hold us back. Lord, I pray, God, for the unfaithful lives, Lord, in our church. For the people that, when it gets down to it, they really don't care how friendship goes or what happens at, at our church. God, I, I pray that you would deal with my heart and you would deal with all of our hearts, Lord, about loving the church and, and being the church together. And God, we would repent of our unfaithfulness and our lack of commitment and return to you. But Lord, only you can tear down the strongholds in our life. And, Lord, that can only happen, Lord, when we hear you knock and when we open the door and invite you in through your presence and your power. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.